Thank you guys so much. It's so fun to be here at the Type Directors Club, one of my favorite places because you know what? <laughs> the best cheese girls. <laughs> my studio is small. We're 10 people and we're old. It's 28 years old. Actually, no, we're coming up on 30 years now. And um, I could show you our big branding projects and all this stuff and kind of establish myself and ourselves in your eyes as um, kind of a mass market, corporate, sliding microphone kind of a guy. But I, what I thought would be much more fun is if I talked about ideas, because the funnest thing I think about being a graphic designer is to bump up against ideas all the time with smart clients and uh, trying to use, trying to harness the power of design to change the way that people think about things and, and think about things in all kinds of different environments and circumstances. So that is what makes me feel really lucky to be a designer, to be able to be on a constant learning mission, I think, uh, about what's possible, what's important to communicate, and with whom we communicate. So I'm showing you this diagram so you get a little understanding of what the inside of my mind looks like. <laughs> Not many people have seen uh, a Venn diagram from the side, but this is what they actually look like. <laughs> and for, for us to create the work that we work, we have this kind of secret recipe, uh, secret sauce, where we try to invoke in our work a little bit of magic, which is about levity, maybe, or, or being able to defy gravity. We try to work in a little bit of nonsense, which is about defying logic. And we knit it together with macrame, <laughs> which is about defying expectations, because with macrame, you take the crappiest twine you can find, and you spend a lot of time with it. You spend an unreasonable amount of time with it, and before you know it, it can hold up your spider plan. <laughs> When these forces come together, we get to that little white triangle in the middle, which is for us the holy grail of uh, the combination of magic, nonsense, and macrame. <coughs> this is a piece I did for the New York Times uh, magazine, uh, sorry, New York Times op-ed page right after 9-11. Uh, a kind of a famous article by Stanley Fish because it questioned whether there were two ways of looking at the truth. Some people call them martyrs and some people call them terrorists. Where does the truth lie? And to get these assignments for the Times is a really interesting thing for, for me as a grown designer because it's a kind of a pop quiz you get about a day to solve a problem. And I read these things and I write words down that I find in them and then I start drawing with the words. And what I did with this was simply write down the word truth and then fold it and realize that, that simply by folding a word, by having a change direction from vertical to horizontal, it might actually have the strength or the power to communicate more deeply. That, that what um, Nathan just said from the Cooper Hewitt, the, the, their quote for awarding me this incredible honor, the National Design Award, was that uh, I was given the award for giving words a deeper meaning, which is well-meaning, but it's not true. What I'm trying to do with my work is to expose the deep meaning that words already have in them. I really thought when I got out of school that I was interested in typography. And it turns out, you guys, to the disappointment of the Type Directors Club, I'm much more interested in language and the power of language and the power of words and the idea of words getting up off the page and out of the computer and out of the vector file and casting a shadow of their own to see if they could actually communicate with more power if they lived in the same three-dimensional world that we did. The other great thing about living in this three-dimensional <coughs> world is being able to work for the New York Times and do an illustration like this that's seen by 300 million people. And it's just the power of language and design and a little bit of photography and a, and a couple pieces of wood. And I recommend that everybody get a little bandsaw for the back of your office and keep it away from your computers. <laughs> One of my great teachers told me that if you do good things, good things happen. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> or ignore. 
like I said, I'm really interested in the power of language, and I'm really interested in getting off of the computer because when words get out into space, they have, I think, more resonance. Um, you guys know Peter Pan, right? The original movie, not any of that animated stuff that might have come after. The reason that Peter Pan meets Wendy is that he forgot his shadow. He lost his shadow. He came back to her room to collect his shadow, which she sews onto his feet. And having a shadow leads to the song, I Got a Crow, because I'm so wonderful. Basically, the idea is, I won't sing it for you tonight. <laughs> but the idea of having a shadow is that it validates that he exists. And I think when, when type gets off of the computer and out of the world of the digital world of Photoshop or InDesign or, you know, even Quark Express in the old days, it assumes a different power over us because it's kind of believable somehow. Lamentations, as you know, how much time do we have? Four hours, right? <laughs> Lamentations is uh, the, the Book of the Dead. So I painted this type on a, uh, a piece of fabric and photographed it in a way that, that alluded to a shroud. The Druid King is about a, a bunch of um, French people trying to resist the armies of uh, Julius Caesar who have metal weapons. And, and uh, these guys in France sat under an oak tree and ate mushrooms. <laughs> you know how the story went. Nabokov was, a, as you know, a lepidopterist. And his stories are so richly beautiful and colorful, and his language is so synesthetic. It seemed only appropriate to use butterfly pins to mount his name onto this book cover of his collected stories, like I collected the letters of his name, and then to be able to read the shadow rather than the highlights because there's something very macabre and dark about his work. Gorgeous author. One of my favorite books of all time. I got assigned this from John Gall, who uh, reissued a whole paperback series of Nabokov, and I think he might have been inspired by my butterfly pins and assigned a bunch of, you've seen these, a bunch of different designers got uh, butterfly boxes and in, in their assignment. <coughs> Hailfire is a gorgeous poem. Uh, it starts with a gorgeous poem by a poet who's writing about his daughter who uh, walked into the lake one day and never returned. So the idea of sort of snuffing out her flame and capturing the smoke in the box really interested me. This was a magazine that we did, magazine cover for IBM uh, about risk. And you know IBM's uh, slogan is think, which is why Apple's slogan is different. Good. Some people watch TV here. Sorry, competing organization. This is a poster for the AMGA. My favorite part is the water logo. It takes a really long to get water to behave like this. This is the uh, text of the 19th Amendment to the Constitution of the U.S., which allowed women the right to vote. To celebrate its 75th anniversary, we plastered the text onto the floor of Grand Central Terminal. And because uh, it ended with this great word sex, which was 9,627 pikas high, <laughs> uh, eight feet tight, actually, we had lots of people who wouldn't otherwise read part of the Constitution. <laughs> so inviting.
You talk about Ted getting off the page, huh? <laughs> when we did this project for the New York Times Magazine, lots of people wanted to know how we, how we got the type there, so I thought I would show you with that little movie. This was a story about higher education, uh, well, high, high school education and um, schools that were beginning to teach character traits like curiosity and grit. And we wanted the, they wanted to sort of suspend somehow these words in the schools themselves. And our answer was to tackle it with uh, painter's tape and install them as these anthropomorphic things and then uh, photograph them from one angle. The kids loved it that you could actually uh, walk into this room and see this distorted type and then step behind the camera and see the thing all straightened down. Anamorphic, not anthropomorphic. It's, it's the kids that were anthropomorphic. They look very much like humans. Unbelievable. This is my favorite one. Way back at Emmett Company, we did this album cover for uh, the Talking Heads. Um, there's David Byrne and his tidy whities. <laughs> and about uh, about a decade later, uh, he came to us and asked us in the year 2000 to create an album cover for him for his album Look Into the Eyeball. And we wanted to have a little bit of nonsense fun with it, so we made a, uh, a plastic slip case for the jewel case so that if you flickered the album, kind of like your old Animal Crackers box where you used to be able to do this thing and the thing turned from a lion into, a, into an elephant, um, we could make them blink. And this is really fun at parties because you could <laughs> blink a lot. <laughs> And then, uh, I guess another 10, 10 or 11 years later, he came back to us uh, and asked us to work on the packaging for the album cover, Here Lies Love, which is the, the musical of the life of Imelda Marcos, which was uh, uh, at the public theater until um, January. Really gorgeous, moving musical. He liked what we did here, so we're working on his next project with him. Have you guys ever heard of Color Guard? It's a kind of a middle of the country thing where the high school kids that don't make it onto the football team <laughs> still get into the gym and they, they throw flags and banners around and toss rifles and sabers and, and do this kind of amazing synchronized dancing. Some group asked David if they could use one of the soundtracks for this thing and he'd never heard of it. So we said, yeah, sure, just send me a videotape when you're done. So they sent this videotape back to him. And he was really blown away, except he realized when he Googled it online that the music really sucked. So he has decided to do a color guard program this spring, taking 10 of the best color guard teams in the country and pairing them with 10 modern musicians. It's going to be a live performance, two nights in Toronto and two nights at the Barclay Center in June. Um, with a really incredible group, and this is the, I'll give you a taste of the vocabulary that we're developing for him. We took a bunch of still pictures from the shoot and made this little nonsensy video. who asked me to um, come tonight. Uh, uh, Graham Clifford and Park, Paul Carlos organized this. Uh, so I thought I would show the identity that we created for Cooper Union where, when I met Paul the first time when I was a teacher there years ago. Um, Cooper Union is, a, as you probably know, uh, an art school, but they also have a school of architecture and a school of engineering. 
So our job was to create a logo for them, which had three elements, and we decided on primary colors that could become spatial and architectural and also kind of crystalline. So it went with engineering and architecture and art. It's so fun to be in 2015 now where things that didn't used to move can move and move all the time. Let me show you an album cover that we just did for Pat Metheny. So things that used to be so static and have so much life, so much fun. First, I just want to show you another face, something we did, an illustration I did for The New Yorker. Uh, this is a doctor that was prescribing painkillers pain in um, such uh, a degree that they were actually becoming killers rather than painkillers. This patient stopped waking up. Um, he's now doing 30 years in Kansas for over-prescribing. Talk about overprescribed. <laughs> this is um, Stephen Colbert's first book that we did uh, about six years ago, I Am America and So Can You, which looks kind of like this. We learned so much working with him. <laughs> we learned about tolerance <laughs> and more tolerance. <laughs> And then, uh, about a year ago, he came back, just like America came back. I wanted this book to have more dimension, like they had redesigned their sets and it was all about America coming back from uh, the, the recession in 2008. So we decided the best way to tackle this <coughs> was to do a book using depthiness. So for every title page in this new book, we photographed Stephen in 2D, and it was kind of interesting, the way you do it is to get, the, the, the whole reason that we see in three dimensions is that we have two eyes, so you need two cameras that are exactly this far apart. You photograph them, and then you smush the images together, and for some reason you take the red plate out of one of them, I don't know, we figured out how to do it. Kind of fun. If you notice, if you can see, um, it's, it's Stephen in the Elric Durer portrait, as well as the Rembrandt portrait, and the Picasso <laughs> and the Van Gogh up there. Now, we did a little experiment, which we didn't follow through with on the book, but it was kind of fun. We wanted to see if we could make the type be three-dimensional as well. We were actually able to photograph Stephen in China, where the book was being assembled by children. <laughs> and they were gluing the 3D glasses into the book before shipping them to the US. I, I, I'm not sure, maybe somebody can help me, but I think the type on the floor says, get back to work. <laughs> and there's a chapter on healthy food. Try our pure beef shake. <laughs> and my favorite, the opening for the chapter on healthcare, where he's using his own book as a guideline to saw off his own leg. <laughs> Okay, glasses down. Glass. <laughs> a couple of years ago, I received in the mail a styrofoam cup from the AIGA, and they said that they were going to use cups, they were sending cups to lots of graphic designers that we would decorate 
and send back to them, and then they're going to make a poster of it. And I just thought it was the most idiotic thing I've ever heard of. <laughs> because, you know, you send cups to graphic designers, and what are they going to do? Everybody's just going to, like, glue a bunch of shit to them. So I decided that my cup was going to be different, and I was going to take away as much of the cup as I could while remaining, uh, keeping the cup thingness that the cup had. <laughs> So sometimes these kind of pointless exercises in, you know, drudgery meets snarkery that we do kind of lead to other ideas like a signage program down at the battery for a carousel called Sea Glass. And the idea there was to make a sign and to remove the letters from the sign in the form of bubbles so that the word was populated with the background the changing color of the landscape and people who would be walking back and forth so that the bubbles would come to life and the sign would kind of frame that. We took that idea a little bit further into the signage that's, that's going into the new newly designed battery, which was to perforate the signs that we were designing so that they were sheer and seemed to kind of come out of the landscape rather than be these, you know, these blades which could be mistaken for advertising. And to incorporate incorporate the lighting and the landscape into the signs themselves just by perforating them. <coughs> so the directional signs will look like this. We're having the Statue of Liberty moved a little bit to the right <laughs> so, that the, so that the sign's accurate. So here is um, here's the carousel sea glass. Maybe some of you guys have seen this kind of crazy nautilus-shaped thing down there that's been being built for the last 27 years. <laughs> um, and our idea here, like I said, was to make the type out of bubbles. But since we since we harnessed that bubble idea for the signs and cut holes out of the signs, we decided we better do something different for the carousel. So what we did was we decided that we would harvest all of the bubbles that we found at the battery in the garden and we would shape them into letters like this and then we would mount those letters onto the glass wall of the carousel. Now the cool thing about this carousel is that it's all sea creatures and they're made out of um, you know they're made out of not gooey plastic stuff that's wiggly and it's all colorful and there will be three pads, three kind of um, rotating discs that they sit on while the whole thing goes around. So each each disc is going to be rotating at a different angle back and forth. I think that's a, kind of a cheese straw. Um, so there are these three discs that are rotating. Meanwhile the whole thing is rotating while these guys are rotating, right? And some of the fish will be going up and down, right? So you're rotating and you're rotating. <laughs> so it's going to be like a little bit nauseating. <laughs> and then when you get to pass my sign and you look out through it, the bubbles, the glass bubbles actually invert the landscape. So it turns everything, it turns the garden that you're looking at upside down, you know, about a hundred times, one in each bubble. So take a little Dramamine before you try this. <laughs> You guys probably know this place. This is Jane's Carousel out in um, Brooklyn Bridge, Bridge Park. Funny thing is, I don't even like carousels, personally. This is a really beautiful carousel. It's from 1922. It's been restored by Jane Wilentz and her incredible craftsmen. And then they had, um, oh my god, the French guy, Jean Nouvel, build a glass pavilion for this thing. And it sits there in Brooklyn Bridge Park. Um, and it has an, this incredible view of Manhattan. Looks like this. So our quandary was to have this very Baroque carousel in a very minimalist box. And we didn't want to put any type onto the container because it was so great. So what we did was design very Baroque typography. We had it manufactured out in Iowa. And then we sunk it into the pavement. So it's kind of a Baroque welcome mat in a very minimalist presentation at the carousel. This is the last time I saw Yankee Stadium, the old one, the original one. And our job uh, was that the New York Parks Department asked us to find a way to tell the history and the heritage of this site in the former site of the park, which was going to become this community park with three different ballparks on it. They hired another graphic design studio who proposed that they have a sign that says, this is the site of the former Yankee Stadium, which was really awesome. And the city was like, 
You're kidding. So they asked us to step in and see if we could solve it. And our big idea was to do a drawing of where the Yankee ballpark was in the site. Only problem is we didn't know how to do it. I was suggesting, you know, let's get bluegrass and we can kind of do it, plant the bluegrass in the outline of the stadium, and then over a while it'll sort of grow and the, the memory will sort of melt, which would be cool. And they're like, dude, the lawn's already bluegrass. So we had it, we worked with an engineer who found a, a company in the Netherlands called Grassmaster. And what they do is they reinforce real turf fields with uh, plastic threads, basically, like soccer stadiums and stuff like that, because they get a lot of wear and tear. So these plastic threads help hold the ground together. And usually it's green because you don't want to know it's there. And we said, you know, hey guys, do you think you could do another color? And they were like, yeah, sure, whatever you want. And we said, well, could you show us a sample? Because this is kind of the big commitment. And it's got to go in front of the city and the public design commission and so on. So about six months later, they sent us this very promising photograph. And we're like, dudes, like, could you water it? <laughs> Cut the grass? This is horrible. We cannot show this to the mayor's office exactly. Well, this went on for a while, but it was really gratifying a year after that when the grass master finally came to the Bronx and started sort of laying this snail trail of blue outlining the outline of Yankee Stadium, which you can see from the air. It's the largest drawing in the Bronx. Thank you very much. <laughs> and you can also see it from the ground, which is kind of cool. We also, with Drew Heffron, who's seated right here, created this thing that we call a Viewmaster, which has, it looks like one of those things where you look across the Grand Canyon, but buried inside of it is one of these little rascals. These things function actually, when you turn the little knob here and see the little caption up there, they're a window into the past where you can see the day. Uh, here's Babe Ruth. You can see the history of the stadium. There are seven of these things positioned in seven positions around the stadium. So 49 images of the past. Here is uh, Lou Gehrig, the day that he resigned. You all remember when Muhammad Ali was fighting up at Yankee Stadium. And I'm sure you all got got there for the Isley Brothers concert. <laughs> <laughs> Too bad we decided on black and white, because this is what they were actually wearing. Got to get that pink suit. <laughs> Spring is right around the corner. We also infiltrated the path with the history of the stadium. There are 49 of these little kind of starfish set into the um, octagonal stones. And we use the benches. When we work in a park, we really like to infiltrate the surfaces that are there rather than put up a bunch of signs so that you can, you know, read about uh, what, when Nelson Mandela, 30 days after he was released from Robben Island Prison in South Africa, he came here and he said, I am a Yankee. So you can read that or you can sit next to it and enjoy your lunch and just ignore it completely. <laughs> target bag. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> we design for the people. <laughs> here's, here's our message infiltrating a wall with uh, Lou Gehrig's famous quote today, I consider the luck, myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. So it's a way to infuse these places with history, kind of like what we did at Grand Central Terminal. Then there's a little message for the little league. <laughs> Everybody's like, oh, which, which ball player said that? Well, it's from Hollywood, it's from Bull Durham. <laughs> you know, put it up anyway. Okay, Times Square. We want you to build a monument to New York's 40 theaters, and you can do anything you want, except it just can't take up any space whatsoever. <laughs> you might bring the parade through there. So we decided that we would just take on the pavement, and we did this stone and steel map of the Broadway Theater District, kind of fun. And we worked with local projects on creating a website which gives the, the story and the history of the 40 theaters and brings them to life a little bit. This is a rendering of a project that we were forced into, which is um, the shark tank at the New York Aquarium's post uh, out on Coney Island. And this was done before we were brought onto the team. 
But I show it here because who can forget the day that Nelson Mandela, <laughs> Indira Gandhi, <laughs> and Gaddafi, <laughs> and Grandpa Walton <laughs> were all at Coney Island <laughs> walking by this thing that the city agency referred to as the worst fucking laundromat in, <laughs> in South Beach that we've ever seen. It's got metal bubbles and neon waves and they're like, God help us, what are you thinking? It's a $154 million project, one of the prize projects of the Bloomberg administration, and they brought them this and they're like, oh my God, Doyle, get in there. So I met with these brilliant architects and convince them that maybe we should just take everything off the building and kind of start over. <laughs> everything. So here's the, here's the building with nothing on it, which is so much better. But our job was to find a way to... The building has to be opaque, it's made of um, concrete, because they have to regulate the temperature and the light and everything for the sharks to make them happy. So. Our challenge was to find a way to bring uh, a solid wall to life. And we looked outside, and this is what we saw. Then we looked at the water. What's with that annoying music? <laughs> and you look under the water and you see how anchovies swarm and dart, and we found this guy called Ned Kahn who makes these incredible building facades that look like the surface of the ocean. They're made of little aluminum tiles about the size of a post-it, and they move with the slightest wind, but they move together so that they have this flowing, fluid motion, and they reflect the sky when they move up, and they reflect the ground when they move down. So it's light and shadow and these beautiful ripples. <laughs> And when we finish this building in 2017, or, or, or 2035, whenever we decided, it will have 48,000 aluminum tiles suspended from its facade that will move with the wind and reflect the sky and look like the surface of the ocean. And I think it'll be a beautiful destination which is actually reflective of the mission of the Wildlife Conservation Society. At night, it'll have little bioluminescent stuff like that, and then that light will go down at about midnight so that the birds can fly safely home. Because they've been out drinking. <laughs> Do you think that books get tired? They hold all that information. I'm really interested in books and the form of books, and that they're actually, just the shape of them is able to have some power to us, just like when we bring words to life, just the shape of a book. You know, I sent one of these into the AIGA book competition, and it didn't get in because one of the jurors said, well, we don't really know what's inside. <laughs> what spoils words? <laughs> this is a, uh, an illustration I created a construction for The New Yorker, a story by John McPhee, where he talked about writer's block and just how long it takes to find a story and to create and to, to dive and to edit and work into something in order for a story to emerge. And it reminded me of, uh, of course, Michelangelo, like probably reminded you of Michelangelo's slave when you read a story like that, and how long it takes a sculpture to find the form. And it was fun to, to find this typewriter hiding in this block of plaster. I could have told you it was stone and you would have believed me I lost my chance. <laughs> This is a fountain in the Bronx uh, that was being renovated, and they asked us to do to create a sign, uh, which would be the dedication of you know the funding of who was paying for the, the renovation. And we just thought it would be such an eyesore to put a, a sign out in front of this, you know, put some posts into the lawn, and then even cut the grass as it is. Can you imagine trying to cut around the sign? So we proposed to them that we make a bronze book, that we borrowed material from the fountain itself and create a book which could sit in front of the fountain. 
And I got to make the book. I got to make the book out of clay. I had a coach from uh, Cooper, one of my old classmates who's a sculptor, and she told me something very interesting. She said that clay does not want to be a book, and that's where you begin. <laughs> Once you make the book, you cast it in plaster, Once you, and then carve it. I carved the type into it, and we cast it into bronze, and I was terrified because it was just ghastly and kind of yellow gold. But by the time we got the patina on it, it's actually working for us. It's kind of fun to go there and see, you know, Dad wants to take a picture of the family in front of the family, and he inevitably goes over and tries to move the book out. Of the <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going anywhere, Pops. <laughs> this was a, an illustration for the New York Times Book Review, a story about how books become more important the more dog-eared they get and the more used and how a really lived-in book reflects the life and the love that it's had. This is a, a carving of my copy of Ulysses. This is carved in stone. <laughs> this was a story about a lost library. It was lost from the dictatorship and then what was remained uh, what remained uh, was lost in the flood and the author was was pining about his library so I decided to create just the skeleton of the books, uh, his memory of them. Another piece for the op-ed page in the Times, uh, the affirmative action case at the University of Michigan. Uh, as I said before, I, I, when I get these articles uh, to illustrate, I write the words down, and I wrote down university, and I wrote diversity, and I looked at it, it as like, oh, awesome, they both end in T-Y. And I looked at it a little bit longer, like, holy cow, they both end in S-I-T-Y. And it wasn't until after a cup of coffee, and maybe even a cigarette, and I, I realized the gift I was given. Again, books as metaphor. This is a Cooper Hewitt signage for a design show. The uh, curator wanted people to think of the museum as a design library. get there the way that other people get there, but eventually I get there. That was a little monument I made. I, I teach a class at SVA uh, in, for Steve Heller's graduate program called Designers Entrepreneur, and I'm so jealous that these guys get to make monuments in my class, I decided to make my own. This used to be a book, this is The Professor's House by Willa Cather, and I began to create it as a parody, it was back in 2000 or 2001, and computer, internet, hypertext was all a new idea, and I thought the idea of hypertext, that, a, that one text would lead to another without the logical sequence, was so kind of ridiculous and sort of insulting to the editorial content um, that I started making this as a parody, but as I made it bigger and bigger, gluing every line in the book to every other line in the book, it actually assumed a sort of a gravitas without having a lot of gravity. It's very lightweight, it's about three feet square, and it's hung from a single thread. There's a little balsam bit structure which holds it 
uh, together. And it hung in my office, and it would move at the slightest breeze, but it would move like this. <laughs> and it was really kind of intoxicating to watch and to see what happens when you take type out of a book. Now, you know I'm interested in books already, the, the, the cast uh, concrete books and stuff like that, but this really kind of turned me on to another way of making things. And this is, this is where I begin to like, defy logic. This is what the, the magic is about, um, or the nonsense, where there's both, um, well, and also the macrame. It's defying expectations when you cut a book apart that it could become some kind of structure that has a different kind of power like this. But it really intrigued me, and it's something that I chased, even though it doesn't make any sense. And it's been really fun to go through our library book by book and ruin them. <laughs> this is The Trial by Franz Kafka. And then people began to see, these other art directors began to see them, and I began to get hired to do them. Nicholas Blackman at the Times asked me to create um, something for a book review on Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers. Um, and this is a chapter called The Trouble with Geniuses, which is that, and you probably know, you guys, it takes 10,000 hours of practice for somebody to become transcendent in their field. Notes from the Underground. Here is New York. This would make a really awesome hat. <laughs> the Waves by Virginia Woolf. So I found, kind of by accident, I stumbled on, uh, on a playground that is all my own of making these illogical contraptions and constructions that have actually come back into my design work and infiltrated my work. Um, this City of Type was uh, for a book cover. Everyone's an author. Put little lanterns inside. This was in Vanity Fair um, about cyber war. Uh, part of the world wants to control everything that's on the internet, and part of the world doesn't. That's us on the right. And then, in the world of illustration, I went beyond that. They, keep, they kept coming to me about cyber war and how the, the new wars are being waged with keyboards and, and cursors and stuff like that. So it was really fun to transform that metaphor of a keyboard into a grenade or arm a tank with cursors. And I've fallen into this, this thing beyond typography of a kind of uh, storytelling with images, which is such a perfect yang to the, to the yin that I've been doing for so many years. This was for Wired magazine about digitizing money. This was a cover for Wired called Money Just Wants to Be Free. You know it does. It's sure free in our house. <laughs> Sorry, honey. <laughs> they know I'm kidding. And this was the New York Times book review. Uh, they had a, a whole bunch of articles about the financial collapse of 2008. And lucky for me, Nicholas Blackman didn't understand the articles either. So I, I set a, a project for myself, which, which was just basically to mess up a bunch of dollar bills and, and never infringe on the border and see how far I could push things. Here's my Comme des Garçons dollar bill. You know, it's funny, the ones, the, the ones that didn't work out so well, I took them back to the bank and I handed them to the teller and I said, I don't know what my kids were thinking. <laughs> and she sympathized with me and gave me fresh ones. <laughs> my kids are in jail now, but we get to visit them. <laughs> My life in Middlemarch. Some poor woman out there reads Middlemarch every year. So this is an illustration of her journal of reading Middlemarches at the different stages of her life and how her appreciation of it has changed dramatically from her um, teenage reading to her middle age reading. Can't wait to hear about the old age reading. You know what I mean? This was an illustration for a magazine in Germany called Greenpeace, and the, the assignment was, show us what peace looks like. So here's Apollo, who is the god of poetry and music, with a wreath of flowers orbiting around his head. A 
two weeks ago in The New Yorker, um, Michael Pollan wrote this incredible article about how people who are dying, mostly dying of cancer, and are afraid of death, um, have their fears assuaged by uh, magic mushrooms, actually. And this, this paint by number painting is kind of a reconstruction of some of the things that they've seen, like the space shuttle taking off and a transparent Michelle Obama coming to take care of them. <laughs> and, and Derek Jeter doing a balletic spin. <laughs> This is upcoming in uh, Esquire magazine next month about uh, a guy who was a, a digital stalker and a woman who was stalked and how his, his digitation got into her digitation. Now a little fun. This is my first venture into pornography for Wired magazine and the sex issue which came out a couple days ago. Uh, I love the title of this article so much, Pornocopia. <laughs> Amazing. So I took a, a Dutch flower painting and showed a kind of a virtual reality porn version of what's going on in there. If you look closely. Everybody's over 21 in here, right? <laughs> oh, upcoming in the New Yorker, lost languages. Apparently, a language goes extinct every 10 minutes. It's the biggest extinction on the planet is that we're losing languages and everybody is switching to English. Such a fun story to illustrate and so sad. <laughs> this is how I cut up the books too. <laughs> Very easy on the fingers. <laughs> <laughs> the internet is so fun. Our, uh, our client at the Battery came to me and asked me to design a poster because she wanted to have a chair competition. I'm like, Rory, you can't even afford to print a poster. Well, let's do something else that could have a little life to it. So we do something like this, and we send it to Swiss Miss, and she posts it, and you know, 67,000 views later. <laughs> One more movie I want to show you, because um, you've all probably had it with my movies. This is a little bumper that we created for the American Express Luxury Summit. And our job was to create a little movie to, as, as a start off for the conference together, be focused on the stage and you know, clapping for the first presenter.
Dazzled by brightness, drawn to it, and smart, just a flame. There was wonder we could see, only in the dark. Seven billion people inherit the earth, and each one is different from the luxury. I think the answer to how to do that is, um, you know, to be found in, in growing up in my family. <laughs> um, For those of us who haven't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and what I mean by that is, I was the youngest of four kids, of four brothers, and uh, it was humor for me that saved the day, because I didn't have the, the strength or the firepower to overcome people, except by using humor as, a, as an infiltration device. That's how you get into the architects, you make them like you, kind of, uh, and, and you know work up these other ideas. How you get it passed is that the Public Design Commission was so thrilled to see something that had magic to it, because the presentation that they saw before was not magical. It's the same with the uh, Yankee Stadium. There was, there's no magic in a sign that says this used to be the place. But if you can show people pictures and draw the thing and infiltrate at lots of different points of entry, infiltrate a public space with a narrative, then that's really magical. And, and they love it. And, and they're part of it. So it's not hard to get it passed. It's hard to get bad work passed, I think. I would know, but I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think I think it's harder and harder to get people to read stuff, especially in public, um, which is why it's fun for me, who has a reading background, and I used to work in magazines, and I and I love books. Uh, it's it's really fun to find a way to infiltrate spaces with a little bit of copy that packs a lot of punch, like the thing at the Grand Central Terminal. That, that, was, that one sentence was the entire uh, amendment, and it was fought over for 75 years before they accepted that one sentence. And I think that uh, condensing and making things uh, palatable and accessible to people, especially as we become more and more multicultural, people are not going to deal with large bodies of text in a public space, because reading a large body of text, like in the Bokoff, is generally a private thing. I think that that's the, the, the fun thing about being a graphic designer, is that you can have an art life and a design life, and they can, they can merge and swirl around each other. Um, my wife says that I'm the most selfish designer that she's ever met. And I'm like, thanks a lot. And she goes, no, 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 hear me out. Because she said, what I, what I tend to do, what she observes me doing, is taking unsuspecting clients 
and bending them to my will so I get to make what I want to make on their dollar. <laughs> so all, you know, it's this, it's a balance of all of that. Anybody? Thank you so much for coming out.